Samuel is currently a theoretical or Samuel is a theoretical physicist who is currently working as a quantum engineer uh, solutions or who is working as a software engineer for the quantum engineering solutions team at Keysight Technologies. He he uh, has a PhD in physics from University of Warwick and actually also did a lot of work at the Institute of Quantum Computing in Waterloo. Uh, he, his main focus is uh, uh, to design strategies to characterize and enhance the performance of noisy quantum computers that are currently available. And today he'll be talking about uh, one of his work where he uh, tried to efficiently improve the performance of noisy quantum computers. So Samuel, please take it away. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for showing up. Uh, my name is Samuele. As it was said, I work as a software engineer at Keysight Technologies, where I'm trying to um, help improving this software through Q that Megan has been using. So it's, it's always good to, to hear customer feedback. Uh, I'm going to repeat a few of the things that Megan has already said, but um, I don't think it's a problem. I, I think it's, it's always good to, to repeat rather than not to. Um, but so today we're going to talk about error mitigation. So here's an overview of, of my talk. I will start by introducing the topic. So I will tell you why error mitigation is important, how it works, and I will go through the advantages and disadvantages of the main available solutions. Then I will present to you NOx and PEC, which are two error mitigation protocols that we have developed at Keysight Technologies. I will tell you what these acronyms mean, how they work, and how they outperform the existing solutions. And finally, I will show you how this Nox and PEC were able to significantly improve the performance of a superconducting quantum computer. So if you want to know more about this, feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, this is all based on a recent paper that we put out in, in January. The authors involved are Keysight employees, so they are my colleagues. There's me, Arnaud, Karim Nandugas, Haman Kwasim, and Joel Wallman. All the other authors are uh, experimentalists from uh, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So let's, let's start by, oh. so error mitigation. I think we all agree that one of the main goals of quantum computers is to estimate expectation values. So essentially what we will be doing, or what we do when we run a quantum computation is we, we prepare a state by running a circuit, we do some measurement, we repeat all this process. And by doing that, we observe some output bit strings that are drawn, for, are sampled from a very specific probability distribution. And then we try to calculate the expectation value of an operator of interest by uh, post-processing these bit strings. Now, this is what we would like to see. In practice, we see something different because as Megan was saying, there's noise. Everything we do is noisy. Gates are slightly imperfect. Qubits talk to each other, they talk with the environment. And so the probability distribution of the frequencies of the, of, of the output strings that we see is not quite right. They are sampled from an incorrect probability distribution. And so when we go and post-process them and calculate the expectation value of the operator of interest, we, we see a bias. So we see an incorrect expectation value. And if we want these quantum computers to be useful, it is paramount that we uh, find ways of suppressing this bias. Now, you're all familiar with the long-term solution. Eventually, we all want to get error correction. The problem is that it's very demanding for today's quantum computers. It has an overhead in qubits. It has an overhead in gates. Because of this reason, uh, we don't think that it will be available anytime soon in the immediate future. And so people have been aware of this and this, this problem paves the way for the development of a number of protocols that today are collectively known as error mitigation protocols. These protocols, instead of qubits and gates, they have an overhead in number of circuits. So essentially what you're trying to do is to kind of uh, isolate the signal from a background of noise. So in general, you will, run, you will need to run more circuits than without error mitigation. Um, but the nice thing is that they have a minima, sometimes non-existing overhead in qubits and gates. And this makes them particularly suitable to NISC devices. So I'll now, uh, now I'll try to, to describe to you how a typical error mitigation protocol works. As I was saying, there's so many error mitigation protocols out there. 
today that it's probably hard to encapsulate them all in a slide. So I apologize in advance if your favorite error mitigation protocol is not described by the scheme. But anyway, for the purposes of, of what comes next. So an error mitigation protocol takes as input a noisy circuit. And the first step is to try and reconstruct the noise that affects the circuit. So to kind of give a mathematical description of this red shape that represents the noise. Once I know what's going on, I know the noise and the gate, then the second step is to try and run circuits with amplified noise. So every error mitigation protocol has a different way of amplifying noise, but very intuitively you can think that if you know exactly what it's the type of noise that is affecting your circuits, you can add a few operations to kind of mimic the noise and, and double it and triple it, etc. And eventually, after you've run all these circuits, you've looked at the probability distribution of the outputs, you try and extrapolate the correct output. So again, every protocol has a different way of doing this, but very intuitively, you can think of this as a fit. You look at the, uh, at the, at the results that you got from the uh, noisy circuits and you try to fit and find the, the correct result. So, so far so good, these protocols have been tried out, they, they work great. The, the problem is that they're not very robust to multi-qubit noise. And the reason lies in this step. So virtually every protocol uh, that relies on, every error mitigation protocol that relies on error reconstruction uses gate set tomography. <clears throat> gate set tomography is a great tool. Uh, it really gives you the, as much detail as possible about your your noise process. The problem is that it's not um, scalable in the number of qubits. And this is something that Megan was already saying. And so the way people typically run this, this protocol is that this, this noise reconstruction based on gate set tomography in a mitigation circuit is by looking at the gates individually. So they would typically look at the bottom gate, ignoring completely the, the two top qubits and try to reconstruct the noise that affects the bottom ones. And then they would ignore the bottom ones and try to reconstruct the noise that affects the top qubits. And you see where the problem lies. Um, actually, you might remember, I, I've heard this many times during my, my bachelor. Uh, in quantum, the whole is not just the sum of the parts. You cannot try and, uh, and get the property of a system by looking at its subsystems individually. If you have a situation like this, where the noise is affecting your whole register, then the reconstruction that you, you get here will lead to inaccurate results. So inaccurate reconstruction then, then propagates all the way to the bottom. It will lead to an inaccurate amplification and eventually to an inaccurate extrapolation. So you will get incorrect results. Now, this is a problem that people are aware of. People have been trying to think of solutions for a while. One method that they've devised um, is to try and amplify the noise in uh, smart ways that does not rely on noise reconstruction. The problem is that these protocols that do not rely on noise reconstruction, they require assumptions on the noise. So you would typically say, let's assume that the, the noise is depolarizing, or it commutes with the gates. And the problem is that in general, the noise will, will, will not uh, abide to, to these conditions. And so again, inaccurate amplification and inaccurate mitigation. Um, so this was a bit the landscape of error mitigation protocols when we, when we started the project. And when we started the project, we were feeling like we had uh, an alternative to error to gate set tomography that could be really useful in this type of scenario. And I'm going to describe it to you right now. So our alternative leverages two protocols. One is randomized compiling, which has been mentioned by, by Megan already. So imagine you have your gates and the noise associated to these gates. So what you would typically do in randomized compiling is you try to sandwich the noise in between some easy operations, where by easy, I mean that there are operations that do not modify the noise very much. They, they do not increase. Somehow the experimentalists are, are, are good at doing this. These are operations like single qubit power gates. And, uh, and you choose these uh, gates at random and you repeat this process many times, you average. And when you repeat an average, then on average, 
what you're getting is a scenario that is completely equivalent to the one on the left hand side. So sandwiching the noise in between randomized compiling gates is to a situation that you can equivalently describe to describe as not having errors with some probabilities and then having a Pauli error on QB1 and then a Pauli error on QB12 and so on and so forth. So essentially with randomized compiling, you are transforming noise processes, arbitrary noise processes into probabilistic Pauli errors. And then the second tool that we have is cycle error reconstruction that Megan uh, mentioned as KNR. So essentially, uh, cycle error reconstruction is a tool that allows you to learn. So it returns a table that contains all of these probabilities uh, of errors. So we tell you this, no error happens with probability 99% and X1 with probability 1% and so on and so forth. So this is essentially is very similar conceptually to Gates at tomography. It is a protocol that describes the noise, but it has two crucial advantages. One, it's, it's scalable in the number of qubits and it does not need you to ignore any subsystems under realistic and verifiable assumptions on the noise. And if you're wondering what these realistic and verifiable assumptions on the noise are, well, KNR just really needs uh, that the many body errors happen with a probability that is negligible compared to few body errors. So what we typically assume is that one body error such as this one or two body errors such as this one happen way more frequently than three and four and five body errors. This is something realistic because it's something that we see happening in experiments uh, consistently. It's also verifiable because if you think and if you hope that your errors uh, have a, a cutoff at two body, you can just try to, to, to quantify the three body errors. And then you see if, uh, if this assumption is truly, uh, is truly being uh, um, met. By, by your setup. So if you're wondering what these errors look like in a real platform, well, these are noise reconstruction data from the chip that we use in our experiments. I understand that this is a particularly hard table to parse if it's the first time that you look at it, but what always, um, well, surprises me is, is the following. So if you look at the errors that are more likely to occur, so the green, and, and the yellow ones. So you will see that they are errors, one body errors affecting idling qubits. So for instance, here we are applying a CZ between qubits seven and six. We're doing nothing on four and five. And the most likely error to cure around 7% probability is 0.7% uh, probability is a Pauli Z on qubit four. Um, so this is very surprising because I would expect that uh, these are the, the, the qubits that are exposed to the biggest quantity, amount of noise, but the experimentalists actually take very good care of those qubits when they apply these gates that what's left outside is the noisiest part in, in, in many platforms. Um, but the, the nice thing that, that I want to remark here is that you wouldn't see these errors by running gates at tomography because these are errors that you only see. If you don't just look at the qubits that undergo the gate, you need to look at the whole system to see these errors. And so back to our work, leveraging randomized compiling and cycle error reconstruction, we developed a new approach to error mitigation where we are able to target cycles rather than individual gates. Where by cycle, I really mean a set of gates that acts in parallel. So ideally at the same time on these joint subsets of qubits rather than individual gates. And in particular, what we did is we designed two error mitigation protocols. The first one is called Pauli error cancellation, and it's based on error cancellation, which is one of the most popular techniques in uh, uh, error mitigation. So essentially you would try to reconstruct the noise and then you would try to add some operations to the circuit and do a clever post-processing such that on average, what you're doing is applying the inverse channel. It's such a way that the, the whole thing builds up to the ideal gate that you want to apply. Now, this sometimes is obscure to people. They, they don't believe that this can actually work. So I've uh, 
uh, if they're not familiar with it. So I've prepared some backup slides. We can talk about this in the Q&A, but this is the main idea. Uh, the second one is noiseless output extrapolation, which is based on noise amplification. You characterize the noise and then you add some operations that reproduce the noise. So you have the circuit with noise to the power of one, circuit with the noise to the power of two, and then you extrapolate and try to see what happens if you have a circuit with noise to the power of zero, so ideal circuit. So these are protocols that have similar characteristics. They have no overhead in qubits whatsoever, unlike uh, error correction. They have a very minimal overhead in, uh, in circuit depth. And more importantly, they are efficient. So they're efficient if, if the noise is moderate, they, they, they require a runtime that is qubit in depth, but in general, they are efficient. You can run them on circuits of, of whatever size um, in a polynomial time. And they both show this nice advantage that is what we motivated our protocol. They are robust to multi-qubit noise, unlike the, the, the existing solutions. And so, over to the last part of my talk, the experimental results. We implemented NOx and PEC on a four qubit superconducting chip at, at LBNN. Actually, it was an eight qubit chip, but the four gray ones that you see were not available at the time of the experiment. We, we were very sad for this because we, we thought that we could actually improve the performance of an eight qubit chip, but uh, uh, we used only four. And we implemented our protocols and classes of circuits that uh, I will talk to you about in, uh, in the next slides. And what we saw was significant performance improvements for all of the circuits that we run, ranging, uh, going from 36% to something about uh, 8 to 2%. Now we'll tell you in more detail what this performance improvement means. But based on these results, we could conclude that NOx and PEC are reliable. And there are also practical solutions for uh, the NISC era. So let's look at one of our experiments, for instance. So the first one was we tried to run a circuit that was producing a W state. A W state is an equal superposition of all the basis states where only one digit is equal to one and all the other digits are equal to zero. Is a state of interest for uh, communication and cryptography. So for two qubits, what you would expect to see if you prepare this state and measure in the computational basis is zero one with probability 50% and one zero with probability 50%. Uh, we started by running the circuit without any type of mitigation and we got the red points which are quite far from the dashed line, which represents the ideal value. They're sort of two, three, four percent of the, the, the ideal value. And then we applied NOx and PEC on top of the unmitigated circuits. And as you can see, uh, now the, the values that we got, the, the estimated probabilities for these two outputs are equal to within error bars to the ideal value. And this is, so the, the protocols worked in this case, and they worked for also three and four qubits. You see that in general, the three qubits, the, the, the unmitigated circuits are uh, way less accurate. And then when we actually use NOx and PEC, we are able to almost always recover the, the, the ideal value or to get very close. So this is what you see if you look at the individual outputs to kind of get a more uh, global uh, understanding of what's going on. Here's a plot where I'm showing the variation distance, which Megan was also talking about. It's the variation distance is a, is a metric between probability distributions. Here I'm comparing the probability distribution of the experimental probability distributions with the ideal ones. Um, it's always a number between zero and one, and the smaller, the better. And you see that uh, there's sort of like a 50% improvement in variation distance between uh, the unmitigated um, case and, and the case where we use our mitigation protocols. So visible improvements and uh, across the, the whole capabilities of the chip. So for the whole set of four qubits experiment. Um, okay, the second experiment that we run and then I'm going to wrap up with quantum phase estimation. So in quantum phase estimation, you uh, 
of a unitary and you have a state psi and you are told that the state is an eigenstate of the of the unitary u with a given uh, eigen, eigenvalue and the task is to find this number kappa in the eigenvalue to try and estimate it so without going too much into the details we implemented quantum phase estimation for a diagonal unitary and for a state psi uh, that is equal to one and we wanted to find exactly this kappa that appears here and the circuit gets really big really fast so essentially you, you start you start off with a bunch of entangling gates and then you end up by having to do uh, an inverse quantum Fourier transform so the, the depth increases very fast and we started with a three qubit experiment we already had depth 19 and this is what we found so the, the plot of the variation distances you see when we use our error mitigation protocols, the variation distance is more or less stay around 4%, except some cases where we probably have some fluctuations. Uh, as opposed to that, the unmitigated circuit is sometimes even around 20 or 24%. So this is probably our most successful story out of this. You might be wondering what happened when we ran the four qubit experiments. And well, it did not go very well. We also put these uh, results in, in the paper. So when you have a four qubit quantum phase estimation circuit, the one that we had had depth 51, and we basically saw that there was no gain in running error mitigation. Unmitigated circuits, they were leading to a variation distance of 30%. Peck gave the same, and Knox gave even higher, so worse results. Um, so these were kind of discouraging results at the beginning, but uh, then they turned out to be very interesting because I think they 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 explain as a, a, an interesting lesson, which is uh, error mitigation is not magic; it has some limitations. Uh, there are a lot of um, drifts going on in our platforms. There are unmodeled noise processes, for instance, no Markovian errors or uh, I told you that we only characterize one and two body errors with K and R, but actually um, three body exist. No? Three body errors happen, uh, maybe less frequently, but when you have a deep circuit, they build up. And so all of these unmodeled noise processes, they build up and in large circuits, they can become dominant and disrupt our protocols. So in particular, for instance, what we think um, messed our results here was the measurement of qubit number four, which was really unstable in time. So we were, we were not able to characterize it in a consistent way because it was truly uh, changing in time um, in, in this deep circuit. Um, you know, this is a device specific problem. Every device uh, will have different, will have other problems. Hopefully better device will have better problems. And so we'll be able to to run our error mitigation protocols on, on even deeper circuits. And so in conclusion, leveraging the protocols that you can find on TrueQ, we have developed a new approach to error mitigation. We have developed and tested two protocols to mitigate noise that acts on an arbitrary number of qubits, potentially the whole register, which is something that the current protocols do not guarantee. And we are working to add NOx and also back uh, to TrueQ. We are also working to, to, to test them on, on larger platforms. We do not expect them to, to break. Like Theoretically, they shouldn't break as we increase the number of qubits, but obviously then there will be challenges to, to, to face when we scale the number of qubits. In any case, if you're interested to, to know more and to see the results of these experiments when, when, we'll, uh, when we'll have them, just follow us on LinkedIn or uh, look at our documentation online. We, we normally uh, talk to, um, we, we normally publish our results in, in both uh, these resources. And so with this, I thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to take questions. Oh, thank you, Samuel, uh, for the great talk. So we have uh, uh, time for at least a couple of questions if anyone has. Thank you.
I have two naive questions. <laughs> the question is naive. If I am allowed. Sure, please go uh, ahead. The, the concept of noise is closely associated with randomness. Now, if I play the words, I say random noise because there are random matrices. So why not random noise? That's one. The other one is in a classic computation, in my experience, the noise is not so bad because it may allow to decipher or reveal the signal. So maybe I'm too far off, but I need some comments on this. Okay. Let's start from commenting the first one and thank you for pointing this out. And then you tell me if this also um, answers the second point or, or not. But uh, you're right. So a random noise is a type of noise that we find in, uh, in noisy quantum computers. Um, coherent noise, so non-random noise is another one. Imagine you want to implement a rotation by an, ang an angle phi you are never going to be able to do phi. You're most likely going to be able phi plus some small delta. And so you, are, you can represent that noise as a unitary that applies deterministically every time you run your circuit. So that's an example of non-probabilistic noise. Um, the nice thing of randomized compiling is that it turns every possible noise uh, type into probabilistic noise. And, and then what we need essentially, we, we are fine with having probabilistic noise so long as it's reproducible. So that means if I run my circuit 10,000 times, I want the errors to appear with the same, ideally with the same probability as they appear in the first one. So this is an assumption that uh, is, I think, universal in quantum computing. Uh, error mitigation protocols need that noise reconstruction protocols need the noise to be reproducible. So this is the type of probabilistic noise that we are able to deal with. Uh, does this answer your first question? Well, probabilistic noise is resorting or relying on the average now, average is known to be a very misleading concept. It's like there is a book, How to Lie with Statistics. And <clears throat> if so, can I afford my circuits to, to be a bit uh, what you call reproducible, but not precise? Yes, so in general, we would use the F things bound to see how far we are from um, a situation where you have probabilistic noise. You're right. Uh, if I just use randomized compiling on a single instance, then I'm not randomizing the noise. If, if I apply randomized compiling an infinite number of times, then the noise becomes perfectly probabilistic. If I just apply it a finite number of times, then uh, by increasing the number of times, I get a polynomial, I get polynomially close to, to having probabilistic noise. This is all accounted in our analysis. Maybe I wasn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't put too many details here, but there are statistical studies that tell you how many circuits you need to run to have statistical errors of this size, and you can just run more circuits to reduce them. And the number of circuits that you need to, to run to, to achieve uh, the value that, that you desire, the, the statistical accuracy that you desire just scales polynomially uh, with the, the size of your circuits. So on my calculator, <clears throat> if I take the log of one or sine of 45, I get precise answer. So for your quantum computer, the suggested one, I'm getting, I have to repeat this so many times before I get precise answer. 
Yeah, but depends what you mean by precise. Um, because for instance, I know ninety is one. For for, for uh, I'm not a quantum chemist, but I know that for instance, chemical accuracy, which is what quantum chemistry uh, people are interested in, is sort of like zero point one percent. If I'm not wrong, I might be wrong. Uh, so you just need to kind of suppress your statistical fluctuations up to when they are smaller than that. And, and then you're happy because you're within your, uh, your desired statistical fluctuations. Okay, thank you. Thank you. How about the second uh, question? Um, so could you just repeat the second question? Please. Sorry for that, but... <laughs> I got carried I have, away with the first one. I have the experience myself, but other people also found it, that sometimes you can get the signal via using noise. Namely, you perturb the system in a noisy way, and somehow the signal, if the system is complicated enough, the signal will show itself better. So is this used in, in what we are talking about here or it's totally? No, these, are, these techniques are inspired by classical techniques. So this is the main idea. So you try to somehow render the noise classical in the sense that it's just some errors happening with some probability. So there's nothing fundamentally quantum going on, going on there. And then you try to amplify the noise and doing some sort of fitting to try to extrapolate the, the zero noise value. So yes, I, I do agree that conceptually these are techniques that uh, have much in common with classical te techniques for doing the same thing. Okay, beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I guess uh, this would be a good point to end today's uh, curiosity uh, seminar. So before we do that, uh, I'll join me please in thanking Samuel and Megan for two excellent talks. And uh, please feel, feel free to stick around uh, for uh, if you want to have any more questions, but let's just end the talk at this point and then we can just have some informal discussions about them. <laughs>